right here on night school all the time we have something called office hours where we sit down and do a q a with somebody important sometimes it's a scholar sometimes it's an activist sometimes it's a politician well tonight we got apparently all three rolled into one earlier today on Tavis Smiley's radio show, which everybody should be listening to. Every single one of y'all should be listening to Tavis Smiley's radio show on KTLA. It was announced that Dr. Cornell West's presidential run would now be augmented, supplemented, beautified, added, advantaged, enhanced by a vice president and me and tavis were actually talking on monday about who that person would be i said it needs to be somebody from the grassroots it needs to be somebody who has a good political analysis and i said i hope it's a sister well cornell was listening or he got good sense himself i think it's the latter and so he announced today that he would be joined on his presidential ticket in his independent run for the presidency in the 2024 election by Dr. Melina Abdullah. And we are blessed. Mm -hmm. We are absolutely blessed to be joined right now by Dr. Melina Abdullah. She is one of the most important and relevant activists we have around she is a brilliant sister she is uh powerful in her own right as a speaker um but now she's joining dr cornell west presidential ticket dr melina abdullah thank you so much for joining me right here right here on night school how are you doing today first of all eat mubarak to you E kareem E kareem it's a beautiful day it's a beautiful day and I got to start it with my brother Tavis and get to close it out with you, brother Mark. And I never expected this day in my whole life. But <laughs> really? <laughs> no, I never. You know why I cuss as much as I do? It's because <laughs> I never expected to run for office. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> you said it wasn't going to come back to bite you. <laughs> no, no. I, I know somebody's going to pull up all the videos starting with last week of me cussing but um my imam says it's okay because it's righteous cussing it's deliberate it's um it's a prayer is what he says i love it i love it i love that cussing is do i i gotta write that one down <laughs> um, so so tell me how this all started you, you are announced today as the vice presidential uh choice of dr cornell west but but what got you here what was the process like what was the journey like um so like so many of us, I was completely uninspired and really, um, I don't know, sickened by the duopoly. I'm sickened by, you know, the embodiment of evil that, as you just reported, bought people milkshakes and thought that'll buy them black votes, right? Um, I'm sickened, though, also by Joe Biden, who you know, young people of my children's generation, my children are 14, 17, and 20, they call him Genocide Joe. And, um, you know, I can't call myself a person of faith and support a genocider. And that's what Joe Biden is. And so when Dr. West declared his candidacy for president of the United States, I became inspired. I became, it, it restored my hope. And so I became an enthusiastic supporter of his campaign when he would come to L.A. If there was a fundraiser I could go to or an event that I could go to, I would go. He came to our 10th anniversary of Black Lives Matter in July of 2023, and he was our keynote speaker. Um, and so I allowed myself to be inspired by him. Um, not too differently than I was inspired by his scholarship when I was a young scholar, right? So, you know, reading his work also committed me to kind of a liberatory model of education. Um, and so as recently as a week and a half ago, I thought I was an enthusiastic supporter of Dr. West. And he came on my radio program on KBLA um, a couple weekends ago. And 
had a great conversation. You know how those Dr. West conversations go. We talked oh, yeah. about everything from Prince to uh, <laughs> Oakland to, you know, politics, right? And it was a great conversation. And then a couple days later, he and his wife called me and mm -hmm. they paused. And, you know, Dr. West be going straight for it. So I wasn't used to that kind of pause. And then they said, well, we're just going to come out with it. And they Ooh. asked me to be his vice presidential running mate. And my wow. heart leapt out of my chest and my soul soared. And I wanted to say yes, because I'm a person who often moves by spirit. And then I had to pull myself back into myself and say, well, let me talk about it with a few folks. But my soul Mark. says yes. But then I called my daughter, my oldest daughter, who's at Howard, and she's my closest political comrade. And I called her and Tandiwe said, absolutely. And she was more excited than me. And then I <laughs> her kids and they all said yes. And then I asked my mama, because I'm 51, but I still ask my mom permission for anything that's major. Um, and my mama and Baba said yes. And then our um, Black Lives Matter grassroots community checked in with them and they all said yes. And so it was a yes, but I never, ever expected this to ever happen. Um, and so I'm, I'm humbled and honored and grateful and even more um, grateful and find it absolutely a blessing that the announcement came on Eid which, you know, we never know when Eid is going to come for sure until the moon is spotted. Um, we also didn't know what day this was going to come. And so I take this as a tremendous blessing and sign. You are running for vice president on a ticket with a Jesus loving black man. You are a black Muslim man. I know there's no tension between you all, but did that play into your, your thought process, the faith, the issue of faith and sort of how that might uh, be received on the campaign trail? Well, I know Dr. West and I know that he loves everyone. I know that he has great respect for people of all faiths. Um, and I know that there's really no, no daylight between um, a God loving person, whether they call themselves Christian or Muslim or whatever faith they practice. Um, I grew up in, um, at greater faith Baptist church, right? I grew mm. up Baptist and married into Islam 22 years ago. I'm single now. So have chosen Islam for myself. Um, but I know that this is the path for me. And whatever path leads us to truth, love, and justice is the path. And um, I also don't take it lightly that I believe that I'm the first Muslim to run for this seat. You absolutely are. Uh, as mm -hmm. far as I know, I remember uh, in 2008 uh, when President Obama was running for president, at the time as Senator Obama, uh, there was a Green Party ticket uh, and I've been a lifelong member of the Green Party uh, and I voted for Cynthia McKinney and Rosa Clemente. Uh, and at that time, there were people who said, you can't do this. There's too much at stake. If you vote for the Green Party, we may end up with John McCain as president and the world is going to blow up. What do you say to people right now who say that whatever we were worried about back then, we should be doubly worried about now? If you were worried about McCain and you were worried about Romney and you were worried about even Bush, uh, you need to be scared to death of Donald J. Trump. Yeah, we should be scared of Donald Trump. We should be um, alarmed. So I don't believe in fear. So we should be alarmed. We should recognize Donald Trump as the devil that he is. We should absolutely recognize Donald Trump as the devil that he is. But just because someone is not the devil um, incarnate as is Donald Trump, doesn't mean that they're working for good. 
And I think that if, and I want to say this, I got to be more careful with my words now. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I think if the Democrats want our vote, they got to earn it. And genocide does not earn my vote. Mm. Um, The abandonment of poor people doesn't earn my vote, right? Um, Kind of uh, selling out to corporate interests doesn't earn my vote. And so if the Democrats want our vote, they got to earn our vote and they haven't earned it. Um, In fact, they betray us constantly and then dare us not to vote for them by saying things like a vote for a third party is a vote for the devil, right? And I don't believe that's the case. I know that's not the case. I know that. Let me me push you on that a little bit. Um, It's a it's a question that we do have to wrestle with. And again, I voted Jill Stein in 2020 and uh, excuse me, I voted Jill Stein in 2016. Uh, Jill Stein didn't win. Uh, You'd be shocked to know Hillary Clinton. I I voted for Jill Stein, too. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 Donald Trump won. And there isn't a day that goes by that somebody doesn't tell me particularly since I came out of Pennsylvania, that had I made different choices, that had other people in my state of Pennsylvania made different choices, Hillary Clinton would be president and the world would be better than if Donald Trump would be president. We wouldn't have the Supreme Court uh, makeup that we have right now. We wouldn't have lost affirmative action, potentially. We wouldn't have lost uh, Roe v. Wade. Uh, What do you say to people who accept the philosophical argument uh, that... um, that we need to make different options and that no one's beholden to, that we're not beholden to anybody uh, politically, that we should be able to vote whoever we want and the Democrats have to earn our vote. They say, yeah, that's good in in, in theory, but in practice, if too many people don't vote for Joe Biden, Donald Trump wins, simple math. And if that happens, then the world will be worse for the most vulnerable people among us. I understand that fear, but I think I I said I don't believe in fear, right? And fear is not going to get me to do something I don't want to do, right? Um, Or the the attempt to make me fearful isn't going to get me to do something I don't want to do. I'm going to also say that I I live in California, so that that actually doesn't hold much water. It don't matter, right? It don't matter, California. Right. But also, you know, I mentioned that I have three children. Two of my children will be voting for the first time in this presidential election. Um, Or voting for the first time in a presidential election. My 20-year-old voted in midterms, right? And neither of them were going to vote for Joe Biden if we were on the ticket or not on the ticket. They might have voted for some down ballot candidates. They might have voted for some ballot propositions, but they were not going to vote for Joe Biden. I think what Dr. West and I are doing, and if if you look at the data, there is no data to support the idea that third party candidates steal votes from other candidates, right? There is data to support the idea that we would we spur folks to vote who might not ordinarily vote. And I want to be clear, I know this because my PhD is actually in political science, right? So I do study this data, right? Um, so most of the folks who will be voting for Dr. West and now me, right, um, are are encouraged because they want a message that says we live in a world of abundance. People can have all of what they need and most of what they want if we make the decision to make it so, right? We can end U.S. empire if we make the decision to make it so. We can make sure people have universal rights to housing and health care and good food and safe communities if we make that decision. And so I think that what we're doing is inspiring people to vote who wouldn't ordinarily vote. And if a few folks are saying, you know, Biden ain't for me, that's because Biden didn't earn their vote. So and this is the last thing I ask you on this, because I want to hear more about your platform. If you knew, and I asked Cornell the same question, if you knew going into October that the election was razor thin, I'm talking about Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, if they were all within the margin of error, uh, and the data suggested that you all uh, could be difference makers, uh, would it change your decision to stay in the race? So this is my first day 
as a vice Fair. presidential Fair. candidate. <laughs> um, we haven't had that conversation yet. First of all, what are the issues that you two as a duo are foregrounding in your campaign? Well, almost all of our planks on our policy platform end with the word justice. So racial justice, absolutely recognizing that um, we can move forward or we can move back. And I think um, both of the political parties are um, either, in some sense, people of color, especially Black people, are being set back. And so we believe in reparations, right? We understand that you can't start running a race late and then they say, what's wrong with you, right? Mm -hmm. um, we believe in um, fairness, fundamental fairness, through the expansion of things like affirmative action, right? Um, we know that there has to be gender justice and gender justice isn't just about the right to have an abortion. It's also about the right to raise your children and have enough resources to do so. It's also about things like, you know, I have this young sister who's um, a young comrade of mine. Her name is Manju and she's the founder of an organization called Operation Period. And I think that you and I um, you're a little younger than me, but you and I are of a generation where we didn't think about things like it is oppressive to women that we have to pay for period products and period products should be free. Mm. Um, and then how, wow. yeah. And how does that particularly impact sisters in prison or poor sisters, right? So gender justice is hugely important. Environmental justice. And when we talk about environmental justice, we're not talking about just save the trees or save the whales. We're also talking about clean water in Jackson and the still clean water they don't have in Flint, Michigan, right? Um, we're talking about, when we talk about justice, we're talking about economic justice. You shouldn't have to work two and three and four jobs to pay your rent, right? People yeah. should have a right to safe and warm and um, good housing as a human right, because you were born into this world as a human being. And so what do all of those things mean? And then of course, as we talk about, you know, things like foreign policy, we have to absolutely end the American empire. Um, and that means a free Palestine. That means paying attention to what's happening in Haiti and on the continent. That means making sure that, um, corporate and capitalist interests don't run rampant throughout the world. So let, let, let's talk about a few of those things you've mentioned. I got people writing in already with questions. Karen D writes in and says, Dr. Abdullah, what is your position on abortion and a woman's right to choose? What do you say? Oh, I absolutely believe that it is your own decision. What, what you do with your body, what I do with my body is my own decision. I don't what? know what else I need to say on that. You know, it, there was a there was a bill uh, or a decision made, I should say, uh, just the other day uh, where in Arizona, where they're saying, wait a minute, we're going to go back to the, the bill from 1864, the law of 18, uh, I believe it was 60, 64. Oh. Um, so where the state before had a 15 week abortion window, they're now saying no abortion, at least based on this old law, no abortions even under the case of incest and rape. I know you don't agree with that. Uh, what's a reasonable period? What's, what should the law allow for in terms of abortion? How long? I don't know. I don't know. Um, and I just want to say what I don't know. I don't know how long of a period. I do know that the idea of blocking women from being able to make decisions for themselves is oppressive. Fair, fair enough. Um, you talked about reparations. There's a lot of debates about reparations, a lot of conversation about reparations. One of the things I found is when I talk to some of the Democratic Party candidates, they say they like reparations. They say they're down for reparations. But when I scratch underneath the surface even a little bit, what they really want is just some targeted investments to all people in some areas. And sometimes they're not even that targeted. Right. Um, what does reparations look like for you? Is it a check? Is it a what, what, is it, what, what does it look so, like? So I live in California, right? We just passed, we're working on reparations here in the state of California. Yeah. Um, and some of those ideas that you mentioned have been introduced 
tax breaks for black people, right? Um, look, all of that is good. Free education for black people. That's free higher education for black people. That's good. But unless there's a check attached to it, mm. unless it's a check plus, you know, it's not reparations. So reparations needs to start with run me my check, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then we can get to the other things. Uh, there are people who say that check should be for all black people here because we're all impacted by the legacy of slavery uh, and white supremacy more specifically. Uh, other people say it should only be for the descendants of American slavery. What do you say? I say, I don't understand why black people are trying to bl block other black people, right? I say I'm a pan-Africanist and I think it's extremely, um, it's an extremely narrow view to act as if black people from the Caribbean weren't enslaved. It means that they should take a comparative slavery class so they understand. Um, it means that they don't understand what was lost to by, by continental Africans when our foremothers and forefathers were taken from villages, right? Um, and so I believe that we shouldn't be trying to say this is who should get reparations. We should say all Black people get reparations. And I, I am a Pan-Africanist, and I know that makes some of the um, people in certain groups angry. Oh, yeah. Very I, I, angry. I, I, I have I have Yvette Carnell coming on, I believe, on Friday night. We're going to have a conversation, a special episode of Office Hours. And I know what she would say to you, I believe, and I don't want to speak for Yvette, but I think what she would say is Caribbean Americans do deserve reparations and CARICOM is for them. They have their justice claim somewhere else. But the people here in the United States are black people who are descendants of slaves and they exclusively deserve it because they're the ones who built this country. Um, and that that's not divisive. That's just a, that's just the targeted justice claim. Um, and, and, and she would probably push back against your Pan-Africanism. Um, yeah. you don't, you, that doesn't bother you too much. <laughs> no, it, it, it doesn't bother me at all. And I think that what kind of people are we when we trying to block other people from getting who are our people, other people who are our people from getting what they are also do. Why do, why are we trying to do this? Why, I, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, if, if the people who owe it wanna fight about it, let them fight about it. But it shouldn't be black people trying to block other black people from getting reparations. You mentioned uh, ending American imperialism. Uh, what does that mean for you in concrete terms? Like, um, what, what what would that look like? What kind of things would we be doing differently? What kind of moves do we have to make to end American imperialism? Um, okay. See, it's late and I probably shouldn't say what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it because our platform is truth, love, and justice, right? That's it. So American empire is tethered to capitalism. You're going to have American empire anytime you have a system of predatory capitalism like the one our economic system is rooted in, right? Because corporations require um, imperial powers to take over space so that they can run rampant and reap um, profits that are... Um, unearned profits at the expense of human life. And so I think that you can't end American imperialism without also ending um, predatory capitalism. You say in predatory capitalism, does that mean that you're okay with some form of capitalism, capitalism as long as it's regulated or is the end game a, a different social arrangement? And you're talking to somebody who's looking for a different social arrangement. So I, this ain't a setup. I'm, I'm saying I, I'm looking for something else. So as a Pan-Africanist, I believe in African scientific socialism. And um, that's where I am. I'm a follower of Julius and Yeti, right? I, um, I use the term predatory capitalism because a lot of um, folks are uncomfortable when you say just straight up capitalism <laughs> is evil. Right. And I don't have time to draw the whole diagram on the board and show how capitalism steals from all working class people, even if you think you're doing all right, you're still being exploited. 
right? Even if you have a house that's beautiful and you get a new car every couple of years, you're still being exploited as a member of the working class because the capitalist class makes their profit off of the unpaid labor of the worker. And so if you are a worker, you are being exploited, some to greater degrees than others. Um, but, you know, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll quote Minister Malcolm, right? You simply cannot have capitalism without racism. You cannot have um, capitalism without imperialism. Mm. You are entering this race, entering this conversation uh, at a very interesting time in history, a very interesting time even in our, our, our current uh, political uh, a crisis. And I'm talking specifically right now about what's going on in Gaza. Uh, since October 7th, there's been uh, what I would consider a genocide in Gaza. Uh, and the United States has been not only uh, sort of uh, silently complicit, but actively complicit through weapons, through defense systems, through, uh, through, through diplomatic protection, through political protection at the, at, in terms of international, uh, legal bodies, uh, you know, watching the U.S. veto ceasefire resolutions at the U.N. Security Council, all the stuff is happening. What does a proper and principled stance on Palestine look like, not as an activist, not as a, not as a, uh, an observer, not as a, even as a scholar, but as vice president and president of the United States, what, what would the proper approach to Palestine be? So let me say first that, you know, Brother Mark, you've been one of the most courageous, outspoken, um, divinely guided human beings in this fight. And um, I look to you often for where we should stand on things. I think that you embody um, the truth of who we've been as Black people around seeing ourselves and the struggles of folks um, other than ourselves, um, but seeing parallels, right? Um, what we're witnessing in Palestine feels similar because it is similar, right? When we're witnessing, um, even before October 7th, right? Oh, yeah. The largest open air prison in history, right? We're witnessing family separation. And sometimes I remember when we would talk about family separation with regard to the so southern weird. border, I would say that feels familiar because Black families have always been separated. It resonates because we know what it's like, what natal alienation means, right? Um, yeah. And so I think that the only thing we can fight for is not just to cease we still say ceasefire now and we want a permanent ceasefire. But we also have to say free Palestine, right? Yeah. So this did not start October 7th. This started more than 75 years ago, right? When someone came into someone else's home, took it and then dehumanized the people who were there and said that this is no longer your home. And so we need a free Palestine. And I think that is... The only solution, and I know Dr. West feels the same that I do, um, that that's what we must fight for. We have to fight for a free Palestine. You said that you and Professor West uh, are on the same page on that issue, and I'm sure you're on the same page on lots of issues. But uh, what are the issues where you all see a, uh, some differences, where you all have some tensions? So, so far, I haven't discovered them. I, I can say we're the language I use is a lot stronger around police abolition. Um, I'm glad I you said that. that. Talk, talk I, to me about that, because that's where I was going. I, one of the things I wondered about, you have been unequivocal uh, about prison abolition, police abolition. Uh, I hear uh, Cornell West use the language of abolition increasingly over the last year or two. Um, but sometimes folk are saying abolition and they mean reform. Sometimes people are saying abolition and they mean something different, so, similar to the reparations conversation. In addition to the kind of different approach to languaging it, do you, is, is there a substantive difference between you and him on the, on the question of, of policing or prisons? 
Um, I don't know that there's a substantively different belief. Um, I can say that there has been difference in language. Okay. So um, for me, I'm very clear. And I think it takes all of us a while to get there. So I can, I, I'm one of the founding members of the Black Lives Matter movement, right? So the yeah. first ever meeting, the first ever marches, July 13th, 2013, here in Los Angeles, where Black Lives Matter was born, I was part of that, right? Even saying that, and I was a part of the fight to end um, police abuse before that. So I was a part of the fight for justice for Oscar Grant and justice for Margaret Mitchell and justice for Devin Brown. I can say all of that, um, but I think it took me some time um, in building this movement to understand why we have to completely abolish the system, why this is a completely irredeemable system, because what we're doing is undoing decades of, of conditioning that says yeah. the only place you find safety is in police. When Black people, we know we ain't never found safety in police. We know that. But everything that's told to us is you find safety in police. So you have to deprogram yourself. So yeah. it took me a while, even in this movement, to understand that even if your uncle who's a cop, you know, people always say, I got an uncle who's a cop. and He's, <laughs> he's funny at the dinner table, right? Yes. And he works for a brutal, murderous system. And so if you want to love your uncle, you need to um, lovingly tell him he needs to quit his job, right? Um, so I'm very clear that we cannot redeem a system of policing that descends from slave catching. We cannot redeem a prison system that descends from plantations. We have to build a system, build new systems of public safety that actually bring safety to Black people and by extension, everybody else. That is uh, a powerful, a powerful thought, um, a powerful idea this idea of producing new worlds, new social arrangements, new responses to harm, new ways of maneuvering through the world. Uh, there are a lot of people who can't imagine that. They like, all I know is when somebody gets shot, I need the police, you know, or I feel unsafe out in the world, I need the police. And, and as an abolitionist, abolitionist myself, I find that work to be among the most important work, getting people to imagine new possibilities, getting people to think outside of the carceral mindset uh, I know how you do that as an activist, and I have a sense of how you do that as a scholar, as a teacher. As a presidential and vice presidential candidate, what's the goal? How do you plan to reach out to voters to get them to think beyond the status quo, to think beyond the pragmatic? Because the pragmatic says y'all can't win. There's no point in running. Vote for Biden. You know, fear Trump. Um, you're trying to get people to imagine something else. How do you do that? Well, really, that's the whole point of this campaign, Right. So the person that I summon into my spirit or have summoned into my spirit every day since this um, invitation was offered is Charlotta Bass. And Charlotta Bass is the first black woman to run for vice president. She ran in 1952 on the Progressive Party ticket. And she said, win or lose, we win by raising the issues. What Dr. West and I offer is an alternative view of the world, um, a radical imagining. Um, when we think about, you know, people like Robin Kelly, who encourage us to radically imagine the world, because if you don't radically imagine, you only going to get what you've always had. And so we radically imagine the world. And for Black people, think about it. You know, you, you started off with a story about hip hop, right? How did we birth hip hop with no, no instruments, right? Um, we invent a whole music form, several of them, as Beyonce is reminding us, right? Um, so how did we do that? It's the radical imagination of Black people, right? How do, how do our 
our mothers and grandmothers um, create soul food out of scraps, right? It's a radical imagination, right? Yeah. Um, and so we have to radically reimagine the world. We have to challenge people to dig into what we know in our own souls and our own spirits. You know, I live in Los Angeles where we have the largest unhoused population in the nation. And um, someone said 75%, but it's actually 82% of the unhoused in, uh, on Skid Row are Black people. And we know in our souls that when you see tents out there, that's not right. You know, there was a little one-year-old baby who froze to death in Los Angeles just a couple months ago. We have to know that that is an evil. And so in the face of evil, what can we do other than work for right? We have to work for right. So this campaign is about knowing what's in your soul. It's about saying we don't have to accept what we've been given. It's about summoning ancestral power. You know, I say mm. we are Mama Harriet Tubman abolitionists, right? Think about Mama Harriet. Nobody had ever seen freedom. Like we couldn't imagine a world where chattel slavery was toppled, right? Or hadn't seen it, but she had the, the vision to imagine it and get everyone else to also imagine it, right? And it's not just Mama Harriet on her own, but all of those in that abolitionist movement. And so that's what we're doing is saying that we can imagine a world where we have, again, all of what we need, housing, healthcare, education from birth to doctorate, right? Um, we can have all of those things if we make the decision to make it so. You have mentioned uh, BLM being a foundational, uh, a foundational member, an organizing member, a founding member. Um, how do you sort of think about the trajectory of, B the trajectory of BLM, which goes from small grassroots movement to international movement to maligned to sort of this moment right now in terms of how that will play into the campaign in other words does the blm label does the blm uh a conversation um undermine or at least work against you all as you run for this office so my allegiance is to my people, right? Um, if I wanted to run for office, to run for office, to feed my ego or um, to feed my ambition, I could have done that, right? Yeah. I could have done that a long time ago. Um, that's not why I'm running, right? I'm running because I believe in Black Lives Matter. I believe that Black Lives Matter. I believe in making Black Lives Matter. And so I wouldn't run to abandon the movement because I wanna be elected. I'm bringing the movement with me, right? Um, I'm grateful that the many, many um, grassroots organizers, the boots on the ground organizers who I consulted with before I said yes, right? Understand that we're all moving forward and this is a way to uplift what we mean when we say defund the police, what we mean when we say we're abolitionists, um, what kinds of things we want for our people. I also wanna be clear that one of my greatest heartbreaks um, has been the theft of the soul of Black Lives Matter, right? That mm, say more. So, you know, you mentioned that Black Lives Matter, we were a small grassroots organization we were just mamas and educators and bus drivers and babas. And, you know, people like Baba Akili and Sister Jan and Mama Paula and I would be out and sometimes it would be five of us. Sometimes it would be 50 of us. Um, we had lots of victories, including the ousting of um, a district attorney, including, you know, winning some policy victories, including just igniting a movement, right? including making it okay to be unapologetically black. If people remember pre-2013, we used to always have to follow up black by saying black and brown or people of color, right? And right. now- Couldn't just be black, couldn't just say black. You couldn't just say black. Now, I mean, think, 
about that victory, we can say just is this is what black folks want. I am black. I'm unapologetically black and I'm fighting for black people right now. We can say it right. 2020, I never expected a um, renaissance of Black Lives Matter, like seven years into the movement. Um, I never expected that I described it as a moment when the world cracked wide open, right? We've been saying defund the police. I didn't expect it to become a mantra and anthem, you know, the clarion call, right? But that happened and it was a beautiful moment to, you know, um, there was a call and I'm gonna tell you this, I don't think I've ever told this story. Kendrick Sampson, who's an actor, and one of my best friends in my- from Insecure, y'all. That's the brother, the light-skinned one from Insecure that Issa should have yeah. chose, continue. Yeah, yeah, Nathan from Insecure, right? Yeah. Um, he's also my spades nemesis, right? Um, so after um, George Floyd was murdered and we all witnessed it, um, Kendrick calls, because neither of us sleep very much, and he calls it like two o'clock in the morning. And he's like, what we gonna do? And so the next day was our weekly protest anyway. And we had been doing them online because of the pandemic. And we said, okay, we got to do it in person. So we did that expecting, you know, more people than usual, but not 5,000 people. Right. Right. <laughs> people, right. 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 So we did a freeway shutdown because you don't waste, you know, thousands of people. You do something bigger. Right. And thankfully, our no normal protest site was right next to a freeway. But we also planned a protest for that Saturday um, when more people would be off work and available. And we met in Pan Pacific Park, which is this park that's near Beverly Hills. And it's a big park. And we couldn't see, a friend of mine describes it this way, we couldn't see our own feet on the ground. There were tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that day. And um, it was a moment that the world cracked wide open. And it was a beautiful, beautiful inflection point. Um, and we also have to remember that counter forces are always at work. And so that Saturday protest, Kendrick was shot repeatedly with rubber bullets. Um, his friend's leg was broken so badly that, um, his bone was sticking through, sticking out of his skin. Um, but we also had an opportunity to move the movement forward. We didn't see other counter forces forming, which were plotting and planning on Black Lives Matter from within. And so a year later, year and a half later, um, some highly paid consultants who had been hired um, and one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter and I had been very dear friends and sisters and we had an agreement that she would run the infrastructure part and I would organize on the ground with all of the 40 chapters that we had. And so we kind of developed it into Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, which was her side of things, and Black Lives Matter Grassroots, which was my side of things. So she would do infrastructure and raise money. And I would be the boots on the ground with the other boots on the ground. None of us were paid, right, um, on the Black Lives Matter Grassroots side. What that's, an important, we, that's an important distinction you make right there. Um, because there are a lot of people who hear BLM and they hear multi-million dollar grants, they hear mansions, they hear houses. Um, what do you say to people who are raising concerns about all of the allegations of money and impropriety with BLM? One, in terms of your own character and credibility, but two, what it might do to a campaign. Because uh, those questions are coming, you know, the world, if y'all make even a, a, a inch of headway, you know the attacks are gonna come, you know the questions are gonna come. How do you deal with that? How, how do you think about that? Well, I mean, long story short is when 
Patrice stepped back for her own reasons. And, you know, I, I don't want to minimize, you know, how people are affected by attacks. Um, so she suffered differently than I did. Okay. And she stepped back and gave legal control to this highly paid consultant. He ultimately stole it. And so all the money was taken um, who, by who, who the, the person. So I said I wasn't going. A friend of mine has a saying, don't give other people a tan off of your sunshine. But I'll say it for you that um, his name is Shalomia Bowers. Um, Bowers Consulting. He's now going by the name Shalomia B because I used to not call him Shalomia because he gave that name to himself. And I think he's trying to dodge his birth name because he also, I'm finding out now, was part of other scams. Oh, uh, okay. Shalomia Bowers, though. We're going right. to do our own research on this to find Bowers. out. Right. So um, he basically ran off with the money and the platforms. Um, not basically, he did run off with the money and the platforms and anybody who does their own investigation can look at the only two 990s that have been filed by them and see that the first year he, um, that he had control, he paid himself $2.3 million. The second year he paid himself $1.7 million. And that's only what we can see in their own tax filings. Wow. So wow. we can't see like all of the kickbacks that I'm hearing. I don't have much proof. I have a little proof that some of those grants that were given to those grassroots organizations that nobody ever heard of, he was giving out those grants, telling people, I'll give you $500,000. You hire me, put me on a contract for 200,000 and you keep the rest, right? So those are kickbacks. That's not something you can look up on the 990s, but a couple people have sent me um, correspondence around that. So I can't prove it, but those are the allegations. September 1st, 2022, so here's the wrap up. We had been trying to amicably um, or through movement, get those resources back. Because imagine if a radical movement actually had $90 million. Imagine what we could do, right? And I also should put it in context. $90 million, I know we think that's a great sum of money. And it is. It, we could do powerful work. But the NAACP got $200 million in that same time period, right? Um, the ACLU, I think, got something like half a billion during that same time period. So nobody's going after them the same way they're coming after BLM. But if but, we had, but, but the, in fairness, with the ACLU and with the NAACP, there there are fewer questions. I don't know of any questions about where that money was spent or how you know how it was used. Or with BLM, people are both hearing these sort of allegations about people like Shalomia, you know, giving themselves two point one million dollars in salary. But they're also talking about again the mansions, the the money being spent, and the argument that that stuff didn't make it to the grassroots branches around the country. Your name wasn't really put in it until later, it seemed like. It seemed like it was more the the, the, the founders whose names got put in. And I spent a lot of time, and Patrice is a friend of mine. You know, I interviewed her, we talked to her. You know, I've, I've heard her explanation for it. Uh, but now that you're running for vice president, your name's going to be in the mix, and you're going to be all up in that mix. Oh, they're going to keep reposting this one photo that they have in uh, 2021. Patrice invited Alicia Garza and I over to the mansion which I didn't know we had bought or the Global Network Foundation had bought. I didn't know that this was property owned by the Global Network Foundation. I was actually lied to and told that it belonged to a white benefactor, right? So Who told you that? I'm not gonna say that part. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna say that part, but- I gotta ask, you ain't gotta tell me, but yeah, I gotta ask. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we're in the backyard and there's a charcuterie board and I'm going to be straight up. I do like cheese. So <laughs> <laughs> I like, I like some good cheese too, right? <laughs> so there's a charcuterie board and there's some champagne, which was not good champagne. It was like Ralph's brand champagne, right? But 
we were sitting there and um, it was supposed to be a celebration of our work. And so there's this moment um, where, and, and Patrice is having it videotaped. And there's this moment where we it's cheers. The you're talking about, right? That's it, right? Okay. There's this moment when we toast and there's a photo of that toast. Or This is the scene though. And yep. we're talking about the movement. And I don't regret anything that I said in the actual interview. I meant everything that I said. Um, but the optics look terrible, right? Yeah. And so I don't think the optics would have looked terrible if we were sitting at some white benefactor's house talking about our work. But when it's a mansion that's owned by Black Lives Matter, it's a whole different context. So if I had known, I probably would have said, I'm going to sit this interview out. I'm going to sit this <laughs> conversation out. But this is you know, basically the only accusation that I know of about me is that I once drank Ralph's brand champagne and ate some cheese in a backyard with Patrice and Alicia. And, you know, that's true. I've never paid myself, though. I've never taken money. I've never had contracts. I've never done all of that, any of that. Um, and I think if we had those resources, which is why, just to fast forward again, um, September 1st, 2022, we decided to file a lawsuit against the Global Network Foundation for the return of our resources and platforms and good name. Um, and unfortunately, because they have all the money in the world or what feels like all the money in the world, I understand, I yeah, I understand their lead attorney is the same lead attorney as Hillary Clinton has. We can't afford him. I wouldn't hire him anyway, but we can't afford him. And so they filed something called an anti slap motion, which blocked us from even going to court and presenting our evidence. Um, but I am grateful that we filed that suit so that we could at least distinguish ourselves and say Black Lives Matter grassroots still exists. We're still the boots on the ground. We're still 33 chapters, um, bringing on um, nine new chapters this year. And you know, as we talk about the conviction, you ain't worried about the name. You know, like back in the day when I, I remember in the '90s, Value Jet. You know what I mean? It was, I used to go home from, from flying from uh, Morehouse to, to Philly on Value Jet. It was like seventy nine dollars for a flight. It was great. Then they crashed a couple of times. Then it was like, you know what? We need to change the name. <laughs> you know, the same airline, but we just can't, you can't you just can't be flying on Value Jet if it crashed. Do, do, do you worry that the name BLM is it, it, it has been tainted so much that you need something different? Well, here's what it is. This is a baby that I helped to birth. And so why should Shalomia Bowers or his um, band of thieves get to steal what I helped to birth? And so that's where I've been. It doesn't mean, you know, that I won't change my mind or we won't change our mind. We've um, begun to talk about Black Lives Matter Detroit is helping us lead this, actually. The at least visual branding, so folks know the difference. So you know that black and yellow is them, and when we incorporate the red, black, and green, that's us, right? Nice. And so, you know, we're, we're grappling with it, but again, we built a movement that's based on group-centered leadership, so I'm grateful. Um, to be able to now serve as director of Black Lives Matter Grassroots, but I'm not the only decision make, maker and I'm I, I'm not the only voice in the movement. So collectively we'll figure out what we want to do. When you decided to run for vice president, did you make a commitment to taking off from work? Did you decide that the organizing is going to take us back seat? Activism for the next few months is going to look different. Uh, so what in your life changes when you run for president, vice president? Less sleep. <laughs> is, is that possible? You don't you get but a few hours anyway. Yeah, no, less sleep. I mean, we'll see what it looks like. I'm committed to still teaching. Um, I talked to my dean about it. My dean is phenomenal um, mm. and has been really, really, this is why a college of ethnic studies is everything, right? Mm -hmm. um, and has committed to 
giving me a more flexible teaching schedule so I don't have to teach all of my classes on campus, right? Um, so that's beautiful, but I, I can't step away from the movement today and, and then I'll, I'll be quiet. And if you wanna ask me anything else, it's fine. Um, but this is April 10th is the angel versary of a brother named Grishario Mack. And um, Grishario Mack was a black father who was experiencing a mental health crisis inside the Crenshaw Baldwin Hills Mall on April 10th of 2018. And um, he needed help and he wasn't bothering anybody, but he was talking to himself and had a kitchen knife with him. And LAPD came into the black mall in Los Angeles, ran up the escalators with quote, every gun blazing, shot this black father to death. And in the process shot up GameStop, shot up TJ Maxx, shot up the whole mall. Um, baby strollers were left strewn about. I um, and thankfully, no one else was killed. But Grishario Mack leaves two little girls without their father. And um, I can't step away from that. Um, over yeah. the last six years, the Mack family, um, the Moore family, um, the Walker family has become my family. Tomorrow is the angel anniversary of Kenneth Ross Jr., another young black father who was killed um, by a multi-murderer cop. Uh, Michael Robbins had already shot three people before moving to Gardena Police Department and killing Kenneth Ross Jr. And tomorrow I'll be with his mom, Sister Fuzia, who's become like a sister to me. And every year we go to Kenneth's grave site and, you know, drink champagne there in Kenneth's name, pour a little bit out for him. And so I'll never leave the movement. I'll never leave the movement. Um, and so the goal again of this vice presidential run is to bring the movement along so that on your show, I can speak the name Kenneth Ross Jr. and Grishario Mack. Um, Dante Wright, his angel versary is also tomorrow. Dante Wright killed by Brooklyn Center Police, by actually the former president of that police association, Kim Potter, murdered Dante Wright. Um, and so I, I can't leave the movement because um, in many ways, the movement has given me um, greater purpose and has become my family. Is a uh, question that I ask all candidates, all activists, all everybody, which is how can the people support you? What do you need? Um, we need more warriors, right? We need more warriors. We need boots on the ground. We need boots on the ground for this presidential campaign. And we know that we're running as independents. And so that is a, a hard hill to climb, right? And yeah. so um, here in California, the only way we get on the ballot is by registering a new political party, the Justice for All Party. And we're doing that in California and several other states. So we want people to re-register um, under the Justice for All Party. Right? Uh, I see. Because you can't just wait for the general election and write you in or vote because you won't be on the ballot. We won't um, be on the ballot. So they need to register for, for Justice for All Party and then you'll get on the ballot. Right. Right. Because, because in some states, we're going to be on um, under smaller political parties. Um, but that's not most states. So we need to get on the ballot that way. And then in some states, it will be a write in campaign. Um, we need volunteers because we don't have no whole lot of money. What did Donald Trump raise in Florida the other day? Like a hundred million dollars or something crazy in right. one dinner. And y'all fellow don't... independent candidate Robert Kennedy just signed up with a billionaire to run for office. So, you know, right. they made different choices. Right. Unless you have a billion dollars I don't know about. Mm -mm. Nope. <laughs> nope. Look, the lights in the front of my house don't even work. Right? <laughs> um, so 
you know, we need volunteers. We don't have a whole lot of money, but we got a whole lot of love. Look, I can guarantee you if you come to our campaign office or, you know, whatever, wherever we setting up shop, we going to have the best music. I guarantee you that. No, that's right. Right. I done hung out with so, Cornell some nights. We had me j jamming. You know what I mean? Man. He, I know he played you some Sly and the Family Stone. You already know. Yeah. You yeah. already know. And he was playing some deep cuts too, man. He, he, he had us all rocking, man. It, it was a beautiful thing. There's a question. I'm, before you guys, I'm going to ask you one more question, uh, or maybe two more. One, one came is coming in from the audience. I don't know this if this is the case or not. Did I lose it? Uh, it was about, I want to bring it up and read it directly. Oh, it was about Sean King. Somebody said, uh, I'll bring it up so you see. Gator said, Mark, can you please ask Melina why she supports Sean King, even though black women keep saying he's a scam? I'm not saying Sean is a, is a scam. I'm, I, I want to be very clear about that. What I am saying is uh, there's a lot of controversy around Sean, and he just became Muslim as well, by the way. He knew about it. I sent him a note and his wife a note. Mm -hmm. um, what is that relationship like? And is, is, is he someone that we can trust based on your opinion? based on your take. So mashallah, I'm so excited to welcome them into the um, Muslim family. That's, that's, a, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing, right? Um, people keep saying he's a scammer or like, I never even, do you know any black people who use the word grifter before? I don't know. Only on, never, only on Twitter, only on Twitter. Right. So I'm going, where'd that word even come from? I ain't never heard the word grifter. Right. So um, they say that, but I don't see any receipts of that. Right. Like, so they say he stole money from families, but then the very same families they say he stole money from say, no, he didn't. So unless somebody can show me receipts, I'm going to say this. The receipts I do have is anytime I ask Sean for something, he never says no. So if I say, Sean, can you come on this little Facebook live to talk about the people's budget with me? He'll say yes. He'll make a way for it to happen. So mm. he's been um, a dear friend. I can say even with this lawsuit against the Global Network Foundation, before we filed the lawsuit, we wrote an open letter to um, to the Global Network Foundation and a bunch of people who you would think signed on did not. But mm -hmm. Sean did. He didn't think about, well, what what does this mean for me? Or, you know, the Global Network Foundation has all the money. Why would I go against them? He didn't say that. He said, I know Melina's work. I know the boots on the ground work of these chapters. And so I'm going to sign on and I'm going to share it. And so I'm somebody who's loyal to people who seem loyal to our people. And that's been my experience with Sean. And I know not everybody loves him the way I love him, but nobody's shown me any reason um, to question him. What's the best case scenario? I'm going to take winning the presidency off the table for a minute because every candidate says they want to win. I'm assuming the best case for everybody running for president is that they become president. That goal aside, what is the other best case scenario? What are the other, what's the ideal outcome from this for you? That our work and our message begin to take hold, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're starting to see it happen even without this campaign or without me in the campaign, right? We are seeing um, people rise up and say free Palestine. We are seeing, even though the Democrats, what did Barack Obama try to say? Oh, defund the police is a snappy slogan, right? Yes. Um, but now- Ooh, I was hot that day. Huh? He, I, was, I was pissed off that day when he said that. So I condescending. Know. And I don't even think it's that snappy, but um, <laughs> it, it just means what it, you know, it right. says what it means. Um, and so I feel like the world, though, is starting to question, why are we spending half of our budget on police when crime is down? 
That doesn't make any sense to me. We spend in half our budget on police, but we got people living on skid row, living on the streets. So I believe it's starting to take hold. What I believe also, so second best case scenario, is that that work, those efforts, those visions, those radical Black visions will translate into what our world looks like. It's not going to be you know, an immediate, it's not going to happen in seven months, but I think we can speed up the pace of it. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that's, that's what my prayer is on that's, this Eid. Yeah. That is a beautiful prayer. I'm, I'm sharing that prayer. I'm echoing that prayer and, and I'm wishing you and Cornell, uh, the best of luck on this uh, campaign run, this presidential run. You've already inspired thousands maybe tens of thousands hell maybe even hundreds of thousands of people already and as you hit the road over this home stretch of the next six months i fully expect uh, more people to be inspired more eyes to be open a more radical agenda to be articulated and i can't wait to see how this thing plays out uh melina best of luck uh to you on your presidential run congrats on being the first muslim to be vice presidential uh ticket uh presence uh, congrats to you on everything that's going on in your life. And of course, Eid Mubarak. Eid Kareem. Thank you so much, brother.